I think without uh, much ado, we're going to constitute the panel uh, to discuss all that we have heard today. Um, we will not take plenty of time. First, let me um, invite the uh, senior partner, Punika Artonis, uh, Chief Tony Idibe, to come take a seat here. Introducing Chief Anthony Idibe, SAN. Chief Anthony Idibe, SAN, is a seasoned legal practitioner with over 35 years' experience. He is the senior partner at Punika Attorneys and Solicitors, a fully integrated and multi dimensional business law practice with offices in Lagos, Abuja, and Asaba, Nigeria. He was elevated to the rank as the acting chairman of Ikeja Hotels PLC, as well as chairman of the Nigerian Bar Association's Legal Profession Regulation Review Committee. He's a notary public, author of many published books and articles, and a renowned resource person. <laughs> Introducing Mr. Ernest Oji. Ernest Oji is a director on the board of Echo Electricity Distribution Company, PLC. He's the managing director of Beta Consortium Limited and chairman of Alpha Consortium Limited. Mr. Oji brings a wealth of experience in the Nigerian power sector, having been involved in all phases of the unbundling and reform of the power holding company of Nigeria, PHCN. Alpha Consortium has established the Power and General Outsourcing Consortium that has handled major power and waste disposal projects in Nigeria including revenue cycle management for PHCN, the National Grid Metering Project, supervising consultants to the National Integrated Power Projects in Ibadan and Lagos Zones ETC. As the lead investor, Beta Consortium led a team of banks, insurance companies, and financial advisors in the bidding and subsequent acquisition of Ikoye Hotels Limited, which is today better known by its flagship Southern Sun Ikoyi Hotel in Lagos, Nigeria. As managing director, Mr. Oji oversaw the redevelopment of Ikoyi Hotel into a world-class hotel facility. He was also responsible for selecting the design team, project managers, project consultants, contractors, ETC, as well as for sourcing equity and debt finance for the project. And last but not least, for our panel to discuss this session today would be the Director General Bureau of Public Enterprises, Mr. Alex. Introducing Mr. Alex A. Oko, the Director General Bureau of Public Enterprises. An alumnus of Harvard Business School, Alex is currently Director General Bureau of Public Enterprises, Nigeria. The BPE is the agency of the federal government of Nigeria with responsibility for the reform of state-owned enterprises in Nigeria through privatization, commercialization, and concessioning. He was until his appointment in April 2017, the managing partner, Ashford and Maguire Consulting Limited, a leading consulting firm with strong focus on business strategy and transformation, human capital development, and financial advisory services. A consummate banker and financial advisor with over 25 years local and international experience in banking and finance. He was managing director and CEO of NNB International Bank from January 2001 to December 2005 during which his transformational leadership repositioned the bank as a leading commercial bank in Nigeria. All right, so before we get into the conversation, let me uh, quickly let it be known that um, we have engineer Sham T. Kolo. He's a director of surveillance and enforcement of the Consumer Protection Council, and uh, he's representing the director general. Please will welcome you, engineer Kolo. So we are all set up. I hope well, we need another microphone for the team on this. I believe we have two. So what we'll do from where they are seated, um, we would grant to each uh, panelist here about three minutes, maybe four max, to sort of like give us their perspectives on all that um, they have heard. And then we would clearly throw some questions at them and subsequently open the questions to the floor. So let me start um, with senior partner, uh, Punuka Artanis, Chief Tony Idibwe. 
Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, just to thank the Honorable Minister um, for his insight into some of the problems in the sector, to thank um, General Gowan for giving us the historical background, and the guest speaker, Jonathan, uh, for very uh, incisive discussion uh, and uh, showing amazing knowledge of um, our own um, regulatory environment. I think he really deserves a round of applause <laughs> for the um, extent of research that he, he did, showing a very good understanding of our uh, system and for the great suggestions that um, he has uh, made. And just to deal with a few issues, um, one of the suggestions that he has made is the uh, breaking up of the business of the discos um, um, so that the discos can um, concentrate on receiving the energy from the generators and the transmission company uh, and then supplying them to suppliers who would then be in charge of actually uh, metering to consumers uh, and collection from those consumers. I think that that's a very good idea. Right now, there's a consultation going on as uh, in relation to uh, franchising disco franchising and it seems that um, there is a misunderstanding that that is the same as the suggestion that has been made by Jonathan. Uh, I think we should look at it very well. It doesn't seem to me that um, as structured today the consultation paper would achieve that objective. The reason is that it seems as if the proposed franchising is going to perpetrate the monopoly of the existing discos because it's the discos that would license the franchisee. There will still be territorial uh, demarcations or monopoly created again. Whereas if you look at the ideal situation that um, Jonathan painted, what should happen is that the supplier at the retail end can buy their electricity from any distributor. They shouldn't be tied to one distributor. Uh, the idea is to simulate higher level of competition between the distribution companies seeking to get suppliers who will take their electricity, the same way the Jenkos would do to ensure that any distributor will take their electricity. So we, we need to um, examine more closely the supplier model which he mentioned and the franchising mo model which we are considering now. And it's good we're having this discussion now because it's still at consultation uh, stage and I'll call on uh, those who have better understanding of it to make contribution to the consultation uh, process. <clears throat> uh, the second issue I'd like to just say a few things about is the eligible uh, customer regime, uh, which we had the privilege of being involved with. Um, two issues, one, uh, there is existing litigation uh, between the discos, Embed, NEC, um, et cetera. Um, which is stalling the implementation uh, or the realization of the eligible customer regime. Uh, also, there is some regulatory issue because it would seem that NEC has actually not formally um, recognized or implemented any of those uh, transactions. Uh, and that, that is um, 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 giving 
sort of um, the wrong signal to this to the system. Uh, I think everybody has um, spoken to the answer. There is need for regulatory certainty. Uh, the regulator needs to be more proactive. A clear long-term regulatory um, uh, agenda needs to be established. And if regulator, if the regulator begins to prevaricate, it sends the wrong signal to the market. So we need to look at um, uh, that. Uh, I think there are so many issues, uh, but um, in the interest of time, I, I would just like to um, uh, stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Chief Ijibwe. Let me come now to Mr. Oji. Um, you are neck deep in it. <laughs> so uh, give us your perspective from all you have heard today. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. Um, thank you for inviting me, uh, Tony, and uh, my 40% shareholder, um, BPE, um, and General. Thanks for being here. And, and spending time with us. I'm sure most people are interested in what I'm going to say, so I've got to be very careful because we are the face of the industry. Uh, being the face of the industry that has problems, we are, are the ones that are, I would say, <clears throat> if anything goes wrong, we are the ones that are in the firing line every day. The problem of the industry is actually quite simple. Um, it continues to be simple. There was a question that was put, I think it was by Jonathan, yes, when he was concluding, which is something like, I think I wrote it down, something of the nature of what model is being implemented in NESI. It's a very simple thing you asked. The question is, what model is being implemented today? When we bought the assets from BPE, it was meant to be a commercial model. The question today is, is it a commercial model? Um, all the issues in the industry, I said they're pretty simple. I want to give you a scenario of what happens in Echo Disco. There is what you call the MITO, multi-year tariff order. It is a very complicated formula that was developed by NERC and approved by BPE, which was used as the model at the time of acquisition of the discos. It states clearly that every six months, there are indices that when they change by more than 5%, adjustments will be made up or down. <coughs> I'll give you the three. That is called what, that's what we call the minor tariff review. Then there is the one we call the major tariff review. The major ones happen maybe once in three years or four years, just depending on the environment. One key thing in the major tariff review would be things like CAPEX investments, OPEX investments, and many other things that have got, gone around in the industry. Now, a good example is the tariff being charged by EcoDisco today. When I want, to, I want to explain the core problem so people can understand what's going on. Today, EcoDisco is asked by NERC, who is our regulator, to charge a tariff of 28 Naira. That's an average tariff of 28 Naira. I've explained how MITO works. The point is when you put the indices that you're meant to put into MITO, the formula will give you a tariff of more than 50 Naira. NERC acknowledges it. We acknowledge it. My boss in BPE acknowledges it. Everybody knows. The problem is, how do you make up that gap? If I'm charging the customers 28 Naira for a product that should be sold at 50 Naira, how, do you, how does this become a commercial business or a commercial enterprise? The economics does not work the way it's being implemented today. I've heard about everything to do with efficiency, improvement, and all that. Now let me take you to the next level. 
<laughs> Sorry, I got that wrong. <laughs> Mr. Yes, Osman. I'm taking, I, I got it right. I'm taking it to the next level. Correct. So, let's look at this now. We are meant to charge 50 Naira. We are being told by our regulator, we cannot charge more than what the regulator has stipulated is against the law. It's illegal, you can go to jail, all that. So we're being told to charge 28 Naira. That is a gap of 22 Naira. Okay, today, a quote disco is the best performing disco for whatever the reason is. We are the best performing disco and our losses are much lower than most other discos. So today, for each unit of electricity, we are able to collect 22 Naira. So take the figures again. 50 Naira, 28 Naira, 22 Naira. Now, the 22 Naira to 28 Naira, we can make improvements. Meaning, if we get more efficient, we do certain things, we can make improvements. But see where the hole exists. The hole exists in the 22 Naira. Between 22 Naira as against a 6 Naira gap. All people talk about is the 6 Naira. Go and make improvements, things will get better. It cannot get better because the hole is in the 22 Naira. Now, let me go to the second one. In 2015, we were buying wholesale electricity from NBET at about 13 Naira. No problem. In 2019, or oh sorry, 2018, there was, or 2017, sorry, there was an adjustment of the exchange rate by NBET because of their contracts, which is right. I agree with what they did. So, NBET increased that price to 23 Naira to the discos. But the discos are not allowed to charge anything more. So, my point is, this is not a commercial enterprise anymore. What we are saying as discos is this. We need someone to make up the gap that exists between what we are told to charge and what we are meant to charge for it to be a commercial business. Once that gap is made up, all these things they are talking about, whether it's eligible customers, MAP, and all that, they fall into what we ought to provide as, as a service to our customers. Okay. Let people, one last thing, sure. let people understand that the only product a distribution company sells is units of electricity. The more we sell, the more profit we can make. Thank okay. you. So that's fine. Um, you have uh, raised the issue of um, whether this is a policy reversal or policy or political interference uh, from government. So very appropriately, the DG of the BPE will now tell you why you have been muscled out of what you should charge. Mr. Alex Oko. Well, th thank you very much, um, Henry. Um, Your Excellency, uh, former Head of State, Your Excellencies, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to start by, you know, um, referring to a comment that was made by the Honorable Minister during his presentation. And that for me encapsulates, you know, the gap between intention and reality, between policy and implementation. He said that, you know, we sold what wasn't working. So the entire privatization um, exercise, which, which has been adjudged, uh, and I think quite rightly so, as the most, uh, you know, uh, comprehensive power sector reform in the entire African continent, you know, was premised, you know, on that uh, on that idea. But for me, the, the problem wasn't that we sold what wasn't working. The problem was that the notion of outsourcing you know, the subsidy that was embedded in what wasn't working it has disrupted the commercial model, the commercial viability of this whole, uh, of this whole industry. Uh, and if you take, you know, the view that between 1980 and 1999, the government, the federal government spent close to $2 billion 
subsidizing the power sector, and the outcome of that was just a mega 1,700 megawatts of power produced. I mean, you then begin to understand the challenge and the rationale behind, you know, privatizing the entire uh, the entire sector. So if you look at the major issues, you know, confronting the sector now, so we're not talking about problems, we're talking about solutions. If you look at the major issues from the perspective of illiquidity and poor infrastructure, I think that they are, they are the results of not implementing, you know, the commercial viability of the sector uh, appropriately. Because capital or investment money is not sentimental. It will flow in the direction it will, in which it will be compensated. So the fact that the sector is unable to attract capital is not because there is a dearth of liquidity, but that li liquidity will not go into the sector that will, it, will, it will not be guaranteed you know, that you know, there will be cost uh, recoverability. So we think, we think that in terms of the model that, um, that has been implemented so far, you know, we need to go back to the issue of ensuring and implementing and installing commercial viability uh, to the sector, especially the discourse, because that is the last mile and that is the collection point for all the liquidity that is supposed to service the entire value chain, right? But if there is a gap, a shortfall, you know, uh, in that segment of the value chain, it then means that government will begin to look for uh, you know, uh, remedial, you know, interventions that may not holistically address the issue. So you talk about payment assurance facility, which for me is an aberration, because if the industry was, or if the sector was uh, recovering the cost and being able to generate uh, commensurate liquidity, there will be no need for that kind of, uh, for, for intervention. So I think that government needs to be a little bit bolder. Uh, NAC needs to promulgate the appropriate pricing mechanism uh, for the sector to recover costs and be able to push that, uh, that liquidity upst upstream to, to, to compensate uh, uh, the, the generation end of the, of, of, the, of the market. Thank you. Okay, so it's all sounding like um, this is um, a disco problem. But I'd like to take the view that we're here discussing the overall model um, for the sector. Uh, we haven't heard much about the GENCOs. And um, if you say Nigeria is producing about 12,000 megawatts, and uh, perhaps about 50% of it is stranded, um, is that a number that is, if you like, uh, appropriate for a nation of our size? Mr. Chief Idibwembe. Thank you very much. Um, I think Nigeria is capable of uh, producing more uh, power. Indeed, um, the need uh, is much more. Uh, we should be able to do at least um, like 80,000 uh, megawatts in Nigeria. Um, however, I think the um, Director General of uh, BP has um, hit the issue on the head. Uh, and also our guest um, uh, our lecturer has spoken about the issue of bankability. Uh, and I think that if we get the bankability of projects um, right, uh, the funds will flow. And if we, if we take the example from uh, the telecommunications industry, and I know that the um, EVC of, the, of uh, NCC is represented uh, here today, uh, if, we, if we take the success of the telecommunication industry, uh, it's apparent that uh, that amount of investment can be um, attracted uh, to Nigeria. Uh, but so far, uh, there is serious investment going on uh, in the generating uh, portion of the industry. And that is why we even have 12,000. And, and there are so many projects that are going on uh, all over the country uh, right now. So in a very short period of time, uh, the capacity would uh, uh, increase, probably uh, double. And the reason is because there seems to be on the tariff side, uh, it looks as if the Jenkos are more favored, as it were. Uh, 
uh, and that the the challenge at the other end, the collection end, um, uh, the discos, um, is not being properly focused on. And and so we need to, in terms of solutions, uh, we need to really think out of the box as to how the disco end uh, can be handled. And of course, one of the solutions that have come up today is to further break them up uh, and then the, the other one is to find a way to address the, the um, discrepancy in the tariff, uh, between the tariff and what they are allowed to collect. Uh, there are two methods you can uh, use. One, you can simply just have the, um, uh, the uh, regulator uh, adjusting MITO and allowing them to charge the correct uh, tariff. However, that's a very political decision, as you can imagine. So the alternative is for them to uh, perhaps consider some way to fund uh, that um, difference. Um, I mean, um, uh, there are many ideas that have been out there, uh, including uh, perhaps uh, creating some promissory note uh, to cover the difference. So they don't actually charge the customer, but they get paid for that. And you would find that in many projects, like um, uh, if you do PPP projects, um, you could have um, shadow toll uh, and other means where you don't want to charge the users of the facility the correct market reflective amount, but you measure it and on the backside, the government will provide some sort of um, uh, um, something to assist uh, the project sponsor uh, with, with that money. So however you look at it, um, I don't want to call it subsidy. <laughs> but, but the reality, uh, and, and the minister, honorable minister today, when, when he was discussing the, the, uh, what, the, the Jenko side, said he didn't want to call it subsidy. <laughs> so. Um, now, discussing the disco side, I don't want to call it subsidy. But because it's a political decision as to whether you will allow them to collect the uh, market reflective tariff, uh, then you have to find a way to match your political decision with making sure that the market is efficient. And I think that is the solution, possibly. Okay, let me then swing this to Mr. Oji. Um, a lot has been said about the last mile and uh, the delivery to the consumer. And the suggestions have been made about um, what was called the um, disco franchising or the supply uh, model that uh, Mr. Cohen spoke about. Um, how would the uh, discos, is that something that you're favorably disposed to or you would view that as somebody snipping off uh, some of your your business opportunities as it were. Um, there, there's something I want to speak to before I get there. There's something you said, and uh, Emmanuel, your chairman, just looked up <laughs> when you talked about Jenkins and that the ones being favored is not true. Jenkins are not being favored. They are. They are. They are. Um, how they make money is based on contracts. And so they're paid as per the contract. How we make money is incentive based. So we make money when we overperform. And when we underperform, we lose money. That's the structure BPE set up at the time of acquisition. So I'm defending you, uh, <laughs> Chairman. No. The question about whether or not discos are interested in a model whereby the wires business is separated from the customer side is not a problem. Let, let, let me break the two things up so people understand the advantages and also maybe have an idea of where the limitations will come from. Look at it from the perspective that the bulk of my assets are wires, the transformers, the wires themselves and all that, that's, that's the bulk of my assets. What is on the customer end is probably just the metering and the small line that comes from the, the connection to the pole is very little. Now, if
if that man doesn't pay, the wire's business suffers. Do you get the point I'm making? Which is the fact that it is advantageous to break up the wire's business. It would make sense. As long as you have a regulated return, guaranteed regulated return for the wire's business, which is similar now to what the Jenkos are doing, which is that for any unit of electricity generated, they get an amount that is paid to them. For us, for us to keep our assets to take 2,000 megawatts or 1,000 megawatts, we get a certain return for that. It is possible. Now, the model that was however used at the time of acquisition was sale of asset. So the entire assets were sold. The lines were sold to us. So they belong to us as per the lines all the way to the customer and then the customers themselves. So it would involve a negotiation to sell that unit out as well from the disco end. Anyway, I think it's a legal thing that you can get into. <laughs> But the point is that it is not a, it's not, it's something that one has to look at in terms of how you break it up. But is it something that is welcome? We wanted it to be more incentive based because we believe we can outperform what was stated at the time of acquisition. However, the problem still remains that this, all of these things we're doing is dancing around a major problem. The tariff, the economics, the, the fundamentals are just not correct. When they are correct, if we give ourselves three years, four years, and it's still not correct, then we can start talking about all these new initiatives. Okay, so um, Mr. Oko, the ordinary Nigerian just wants to receive stable electricity. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, the good thing here is many Many other assets of government have been privatized before now. Uh, Chief Ijibwe gives the example, order, order, order. Chief Ijibwe gives the example of telecoms. We know that the airlines also have experienced some form of privatization or unbundling. Um, why is this power sector so convoluted, so complicated, wrapped around too many policies and legalese. Can you help us break it down? What can we do so the average Nigerian can get at least six hours, nine hours uninterrupted power every day? Henry, uh, uh, this is totally unfair. <laughs> I don't know why you threw the, <laughs> the most difficult um, question uh, at me, but, but, but I'll make a few uh, attempts. First, let me weigh in on this uh, issue, uh, you know, between the discos and the Jenkos. Uh, I think that the Jenkos are not really favored, uh, but they are certainly in a better position than the discos, clearly. Um, to the extent that, you know, they have just one major buyer, that buyer is a pseudo sovereign, so the receivables from those um, from from the uh, from the buyer are fairly fairly uh, assured. It may take a while, but they get paid eventually. I think they started off with about 20% of uh, the invoice payment, went as far as 80% up to last year. Now, because of the depletion of the payment assurance facility, is getting back to about 20%. But ultimately they get paid. So it's not some uh, revenue that is lost. Um, but the reality for the discos is completely different. You know, when you have the revenues, you know, uh, being uh, uh, compromised by issues around power theft, you know, meter bypass and all of that, those are permanent losses. And they are losses for which they are responsible to embed, you know, for, for payment. So the payment obligation is real. The collection benefit may not crystallize. So it's a totally different uh, reality, business reality uh, for, for the discos. But in terms of, um, you know, how do we just solve this whole uh, issue? Um, it, it's, not, it's not very, very easy because there are certain 
uh, decisions that government will have to take. We recognize that there is a shortfall uh, in terms of the tariff, right, between the energy, the price of the energy bought by the discos and the rate at which the energy is sold to the consumers. What do we do with that shortfall in the interim? We can take a view that, well, because to a large extent, we still view this service as a social service. So perhaps government wants to put in a framework uh, basically to cushion that shortfall. Or we can say just like we did in the telecom sector, which was totally liberalized, right? We can say, okay, let the actual cost of this service, this utility, be borne by the consumers. And perhaps maybe that will begin to moderate our behavior in terms of consumption, how we use this, this facility. But what we must come to terms with, ladies and gentlemen, what we must come to terms with is that the government cannot assume that the private sector investors in this whole power value chain will take on the subsidy that government was providing for the sector. It, it just doesn't make sense. They are there to make, you know, um, to make money. It's a business for them. So a private sector investor cannot be expected to subsidize a government uh, uh, service. So we go back to the point that we have to install commercial viability for the sector. Issues around the cost of that service have to be clearly you know, uh, defined and how that cost is recovered in terms of pricing also has to be completely agreed on. You know, whether it is coming from government, and we've mooted a, a number of ideas. If for you know, certain political reasons, we're not able to pass on that cost, perhaps we should begin to float a bond, right, that will bridge that gap in the interim. And as service and loss levels through the ATC and C reduces, then we can adjust the tariff to pay back the bond. So there are very many creative ways, you know, of addressing this shortfall. But the important thing is that we must admit that that shortfall exists and that we are articulating a broad set of, um, of initiatives, you know, to, 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 resolve, to resolve that. Because if government continues to use these, uh, uh, you know, uh, abnormal interventions, so today is a payment assurance facility, tomorrow we are looking at a 71 billion devoted to distribution infrastructure improvement, next we are looking at some other World Bank intervention, it really doesn't solve the problem, right? We have to ensure that the, 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 the sector itself is run in a way that commercially they are able to recover cost and such be able to attract investment, necessary investment to improve the, the infrastructure uh, to, run, to run the business. Thank you. Okay, also just, um, so forgive me also for asking what may sound like a very elementary question. I suppose that the, the tariff that is imposed on the discos is what they've inherited from NBET, from whom they, they buy power. Is it's that what NEC, it is? Actually. It's NEC. NEC. NEC determines the tariff. Yes, but so we're looking at um, the numbers that uh, Cohen put up, um, about 778 billion debt, yeah? In debt, and uh, the discos have only paid about 301. So that debt level is very high. It's not sustainable, and it's multiplying every day. Yeah? There is a shortfall on the other side. That's one side. Okay, that's why I said, you know, I'm not a practitioner in the industry, so forgive me for asking it as base as it may sound. But between that and something that I heard afresh today, the concept of power storage um, to mitigate perhaps the losses, how does that work, really? Uh, maybe Ernest or Alex, you want to try? Um, power storage actually deals with a totally different issue, which is that of quality of service. Um, just to describe what it can achieve, um, if you have intermittent supply, like we have in Nigeria, supply problems, it goes off and on and all that, you have storage. Storage helps you bridge those periods where it goes down and comes back up. 
which is fantastic. The problem again is you're adding more assets, so it will cost you even more. And so, you know, when you talked about franchising, it's fantastic, it's a good idea. But the question is, are you going to charge commercial tariffs? If you're not going to charge commercial tariffs, you're going to charge the same tariff today, then it won't work. That's the truth of the matter. So the question, therefore, is, let's take it to, the, to another one, is why don't you then give these schools the tariffs and see if they can do what you think you would achieve by franchising? Because that is the truth. You know, um, in Lagos, I think the um, IPPs that were in Lagos were charging 60 or, or so 70 naira contracted. But on the disco side, we're being told to charge 28 naira. It, it just can't work. So everything we're doing is cosmetic. Yes, with cosmetics, you can hide some cracks but people can still tell that you are old. That is the problem. So, the, I, the, I just want to Ernest, ask Ernest, no, before you answer. The women are not happy with you at all. I, I mean, that is, please, that statement stands withdrawn from the proceedings of this conference. I, I Don't just worry, they understand. I a distinction between, yeah? I wanted to make a distinction between franchising and energy retailing, and, and it's quite, it's, it's different. The concept that um, obtains in the UK, which uh, Jonathan spoke to, you know, um, is about aggregating power, and through service you're able to then choose who the consumers are that you want to serve, or, so sorry, put differently, the consumers are able to choose who the retailers are. That is not franchising because the retailers don't own the distribution infrastructure, right? In this case, and the way that the, um, the privatization was conceptualized, is that the discos actually own the distribution assets. They own the distribution infrastructure, right? And they are also retailing, at the same time, the power directly to the consumers. So also the... Um, issues around metering and all of that also are domiciled within the sphere of their operation. And the past sector recovery plan actually envisages that at the point at which the market then uh, moves to that stage, to the, uh, you know, uh, what you call the stage where all the bilaterals and all the contracts are activated, there will be the opportunity for retailers to come into the market at that point in time. But they will be operating through the discos. The way that the franchising is going on right now is actually balkanizing the discos and the franchise areas. And it is you know, a bit confusing uh, 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 in, the, in the entire uh, value chain. In fact, some of the franchisees are also power producers. So they are embedding generation within the area, producing and they're retailing at the same time and they are enjoying you know, uh, a tariff differential. So, so that's the point. So it just distorts the entire, the entire market. So we are not against franchising. We're just saying that we are not there yet. And the modality within which it is being implemented also needs to be reviewed by, by NEC. Uh, just, just to address one issue about um, you know, how can you have um, the retail uh, suppliers come in and then still have the distributors uh, owning the assets. Uh, I think we can conceptualize a situation where uh, you have that relationship without necessarily transferring assets from the distributor to the retailer. And you can, uh, you can learn from some other models like you know, um, how uh, pipelines, we are dealing with pipelines in Nigeria where you know somebody owns the pipeline and then other people contribute um, crude oil into the pipeline and then they charge uh, crude handling charge, uh, charges on, on those. So, so it's possible that you know, we could have retail players and then uh, we, we could have uh, tolling charges you know, for every, every, any person's uh, transmission or wires that are used to supply to that person and then allowing that person to choose from any supplier because that must be an ultimate uh, aim for full competitiveness to um, uh, arise in this market. However, I agree 
completely that the issue of tariff needs to be um, addressed. And again, that is a political decision. So we have to have uh, the political will to, uh, uh, to actually change the, um, the sector. And I think that's what it boils down to. Thank you. Yes, Ernest, you want to add something? Yes, on. Okay, I actually wanted to speak to the loaded question that was uh, aimed at Alex, which is how to get power to everybody on the, what you call an interrupted power supply, but quite frankly, that is still ways down, but let's call it more like reliable supply. I want to give you what we did at EcoDisco. Um, uh, there's someone who's here, I, I will mention his name, uh, he's Dr. Abba. He's actually, he used to be a NERC chairman, he's, he's somewhere around. Um, he worked very hard with us to get us to do the first bilateral contract. The very first bilateral contract with a company called Paras Energy for 40 megawatts. Now we contracted the 40 megawatts because we felt it to be a lot more steady and we could get a lot more power from the grid above what we're supposed to get. Now, we took a while, it took us almost a year to get regulatory approval. Obviously it was because it was the very first one, they didn't quite know how to handle it, and, but we did get it. After we got it, we started supplying it. In fact, at a point, you know, when you hear 40 megawatts, it doesn't sound like a lot, but there was a time we were getting only 200, 250 megawatts. So 40 was close to 20% of the energy we were getting in Echo Disco. It was significant. However, after a year, a year and a half, the entire thing collapsed for one singular reason. The tariff we were paying to them we needed to pay them 100%. However, the tariff we were collecting was not enough for us to be able to pay them 100%. Let me go back to the model that I had explained earlier, or, or the numbers. 50 Naira is what we're supposed to charge. 28 Naira is what we're asked to charge. What we are collecting, 22. The amount we pay for wholesale energy that is the amount we pay to NBET is 22 Naira per unit of energy. Between 22 and 23 Naira per unit of energy. If you add transmission, it gets to closer to 24, 25 for one unit of energy. So we are already, we are 22. That's the entire revenue we get as a disco. We've not talked of capex. We've not talked of maintenance. We've not talked of operations. We've not talked about salaries. So. The point is, people have to realize that all the noise you hear about, in fact, in there lies your meters. All the things people talk about have no meter. It's inside there. So people have to realize that the number one problem we have as a sector is the tariff shortfall. Let me put another number that will shock you. Today, I think uh, uh, DG had mentioned that the shortfall is more than one trillion already. But let me tell you what it does to the books of the discos. I will not name a disco, but there is a disco at the time it was sold had a hundred billion in shareholders' funds. One hundred billion in shareholders' funds. Can you imagine how bankable that disco was at the beginning? Today, that disco is at minus 125 billion in losses. Okay, just wait. <laughs> we, will, we will open the, 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 the questions to the floor. Uh, but before we do that, and I don't know, um, Alex, <laughs> Mr. Oko, yes. maybe again to come to you. I don't think this will be very difficult, or even Ernest can handle this. It's been said, I mean, more like word on the streets that a lot of the people who bought the discos were engaging in speculative purchases, uh, questioning the degree of due diligence 
that you carried out at the time of the purchases. Yeah? So to come back now after you have acquired the assets, to begin to point out all of the so-called shortfalls appears to be like, you know, you knew what you were getting into, but you were trying to be clever by half. But hold on a second. The microphone will go to the floor. We will take three questions for the panelists, and then um, you will come back to answer. So let me see. One hand has been there. The gentleman with the yellow tie. OK. Will that work? Yes. Try. Is it working? Are you sure? OK. So please keep the questions short. Uh, coming. Chairman. OK. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Ben Sorry, that microphone's not good. Let's change it to this one. Hello. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Ben Gaudusoya, and I'm uh, with uh, Kut Synergy IPP. But, you see, I've been struggling with something here, and uh, Henry is trying to get me there. Uh, earlier on, when the chairman was giving uh, his speech, he said um, they were owed 75 billion. I'm owed 75 billion, and I'm going again to buy a farm, another power plant. So why am I doing that? I mean, now uh, um, uh, the gentleman at Eco Disco and is saying that it's a cosmetic. I'm selling less if my product I'm buying. Why am I selling? Why don't I return it back to BPE and then move on with another business eh, or transfer? You know? So it, it puzzled me that what, what is the problem? Maybe the director of BPE is here. Maybe he will tell us something I don't know. I mean, because we are upcoming IPPs. And if this kind of uh, you know, <laughs> problem is uh, being envisaged or coming up, I mean, maybe something we don't know. I mean, and that's where I'm uh, really bothered. Okay. Mm. <coughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, mine is not a question. I just want to make some. I'm from NEC. My name is Ahamadu Zubairu. Nek. Yes, I'm from NEC. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I'm the head of licensing. Um, I want to make uh, further clarification and comments on two issues that have been recurring here. One, the issue of tariff. I've had uh, Ernest talk more about tariff, 28 Naira, 50. Well, um, NEC has no problem in allowing cost-reflective tariff. That is the position. But there has to be some things to be put in place, especially MITRE. We have regulation in place, mini grid regulation. And many people have gone into that mini grid. People are charging up to 175 naira per kilowatt hour mini grid. And customers are paying far, far up in the villages. So the issue here with tariff is that if the customers are being metered, I believe no Nigerian will bother about paying 45 naira or 50 naira once we are getting supply. 247. So the issue is not because. Why are people in the villages, mini grid, paying 175 naira? 175 naira per kilowatt hour. And they are living. We have the eligible customer regulation. People are leaving the discourse and subscribing to be an eligible customer. Their tariff is higher. The minister said it this morning. And many people want to go. On the eligible customer, is not the whole. Uh, program that has been stalled by the court process. No. Only very few, those that belong to MAN, Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. Few of them have taken neck to court because of the MITO. For those applicants, the applications have been suspended until the court matter is settled out. But again, there are other applicants that were processing their applications. We have issued some, we have registered them as eligible customers, and many more are pending. We are processing it. In the eligible customer regulation, there are responsibilities of the applicant who has applied to be registered as an eligible customer. And the supplier, too, has an obligation to meet before we allow him to supply to an eligible customer. 
So you find out that, I don't want to mention names, some eligible customers have met their requirements, but the issue we're having now in the commission is with the supplier, who is the generating company, they are yet to meet their own obligation, the, the, the requirements. Like the capacity they have contracted with MBED, they need to prove to the commission that they are not selling that capacity to an eligible customer. It has to be a renegotiated capacity. They either go to embed or renegotiate that we want to sell the excess. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Too many things at the same time. Take the microphone first. We will come back to you. Bring the microphone. We need it. One last question here. I think him before you, sir. Sorry. His hands were up here. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. He's our chairman. He would... Uh, Yes. Sorry. Is Good afternoon, everybody. My question is to the DG BP. What are the plans that the BP have to ensure that this school are held to their performance agreement and their vesting contracts? Okay. Um, let me hear from the former DJ of the BP. Please, I'm not here in that capacity. I'm here as a private. <laughs> I'm here as a private citizen because I'm going to ask my DJ a question also. <laughs> He's not very favorably disposed towards the PAG, but I believe that if they didn't put that in place, PAG, the system would have collapsed by now. It injected momentary liquidity. It's not ideal, but in some situations, given our environment, this kinds of ad hoc intervention may be necessary for short to medium term purposes. The bond issue can be a long term plan, but it will take a little time for us to get to that stage. So I was even going to advocate, thinking that minister will be here, that in my personal view, they need to extend the PAG to at least give some bit of breathing space for the uh, operators, Bojenkos and Discos to have some bit of room to um, do some things in the overall health of the industry as a whole. Number two thing I want to say is for, the, for NEC, whatever we want to say, NEC requires some level of regulatory maturity. And I listened to the minister very carefully and it seemed, in my opinion, to be passing a lot of the buck to NEC. But given our own environment level of development, NEC will still require governmental assistance to get them up to speed to where they ought to be at this stage. The bulk of what we're talking about, minus the issue of um, liquidity, we need NEC to truly be the driver. But the question is, sincerely speaking, is NEC currently in the state to be thoroughly equipped to drive the system very, very well. I, I have my doubts. I have my doubts whether they should do so. And the scaling the needs will require governmental assistance, one way or the other. I was also going to address the minister on, he talked a lot about solar energy. We know that solar energy is, a bit, is more expensive by every standard, makes, makes very, very, very expensive. That's you know, for the overall benefit of the economy. Is there something still that we can't run away from subsidy? The problem is abuse of subsidy, really. And we can't throw away always, maybe with the bath water. Sometimes maybe we work harder to see how do we successfully, you know, midwife the process of subsidy intervention to achieve results without it being subject to abuse. We won't say because it's often abuse, we throw it away. For us to have, solar is good but it's very expensive energy. Is there anything the government can still consider to make it a little more affordable and available on a broad scale? And um, finally, because of time, I was going to talk about the, um, the lot of, uh, my duties is seem to be biased towards uh, this school. But you listen to the calls, they are complaining that this calls are withholding their money they're not paying them, and so on and so forth. And uh, again, we agree that these schools have more challenges than Jenko's. For example, some discos we are aware of have been trying to offload, and nobody is willing to buy from them 
because we know that it doesn't make any economic sense to buy. They're running at huge uh, losses. But at the same time, this is also impacting on Genkos because Genkos will get them ordinarily, ultimately, from this schools. And then, so the thing is like, it's, it's, it affects every sector, everybody, both Genkos, both these schools, and all that. And a bit of pro profound respect, regulatory arrogance, or arrogance on the part of NBET. We are heaping a lot of things on, um, on neck, but NBET also needs to come to speed to take their proper place, to see what they can do to improve all these things. But overall, I think that we can run away from governmental intervention in improving. Chief Idibwe has said variously about three times now that to apply fully multi-year tariff is a big political challenge for government. And you know government must also be sensitive to ability to afford by populace. So it will be quite difficult on the medium term to have us implement fully the multi-year tariff order. So what is solution? What is still the solution apart from governmental intervention? There is something that government can still do to help the entire system for us because we can't compare power with telecom. This one is most socially sensitive. It's not just like telecoms. We can't always say it worked in telecoms, so why is it not working? They're, they're entirely different things. The complication of power sector is far, far, far more than you have in telecoms. Telecoms is something you can afford to avoid, but not power. Power is still core 100% social service. And this is where perhaps part of the friction we're experiencing is coming from. Thank you. OK. So, so thank God um, government is not in a position to privatize air and water. We'll be dead. <laughs> Chairman. OK. Thank you, everyone. Please, uh, I don't want it to appear that I'm, uh, I'm speaking so much, but having been a, uh, a participant in the power sector, somebody asked a question, if we are still being owed 75 billion, why are you still buying our from? This is our country. We believe in Nigeria. We believe the requirement for power is about 60,000 60, megawatts. No, don't, don't worry. And so we will continue to make investments in the sector, yes. But let me also say that, please, we have had many sessions. I'm sure the panelists and so many of us in various fora will talk about power, 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 power. But more talk, less action. One of the things we proposed some time ago, and, and I'm putting it down here because we have our father here and a million people here, is that the government can organize what we call a one-week power workshop with solutions. If it is possible from the presidency, we will put the Minister of Power Minister of uh, Finance, uh, Minister of National Planning, you bring in NEC, you bring in MBET, you bring in the power generating companies, you bring in the gas producers, you bring in uh, the discos, 11 of them. I don't mind if you have, for each company, come with uh, a team of, say, three or so. We agree that for that one week, we will all live in Asorok, work there, finish there, agree things, and then implement. That's why when I, when I was speaking, I said, let's end the blank game. Because and he speaks, he talks of one thing. I speak in another fora, I'll talk another thing. Uh, you know, the senior partner will speak. Then we're all saying the same thing, the same thing. Meanwhile, nothing is happening. Now, let me give you a, give, a small example. Sorry, sir. Take, for example, gas. We produce gas. We, we flare gas in this country. Now, uh, Chudi, sorry, I mean, I, I didn't, he was running up his hand, but he is the, the CEO of the Niger, Niger Delta Power Holding. He has about seven power plants in this country. I hope I'm right, sir. Eight, eight power plants under him. He doesn't have enough gas. I don't have enough gas. Now, the gas producers, suppose for the short term, Government says every gas producer, 30% of the gas you produce, you cannot export it. It must be given to the power generating plants. As a rule, 
in that meeting where everybody will be there, it will be agreed, signed by you know the ministers or the minister of uh, petroleum or whoever, and the power company. Sorry, gas no. So there's no question of anybody going back because he's going to get eight dollar per um, million scoff. That's what the way they produce it. Okay, he's going to get eight dollars. The power producer, the gas producer, wants to sell his gas to, let me use the word, the power, the cement company, at eight dollars. I buy at two dollar fifty or three dollar thirty with transportation as approved by the government. I can buy at eight dollars also, but if I buy at eight dollars, you must allow me to produce and charge the end user at a higher price. We we'll come back to the same tariff issue. But if the government says, sorry, this is our country, produce this gas, 30% of that, 40% of that, you don't know the requirements I need, everybody else here needs. And in the short run, sell it at $3.30, next year it will be $3.50, next year it will be $4, gradually removing the subsidy, if you like to say subsidy. That way, I will get enough gas I can produce. I told you this morning my report, that's all I can do, it's gone, it's gone. I only produce 100 megawatts. Meanwhile, somebody is looking for power somewhere. That's for the long, uh, short term. Long run is what I said, for example, uh, government says, oh, Sapele plant, behind you is just a gas field. Take it, produce it. It will take you three years or four years to produce your gas you know, properly. Take it, over time you have your gas. You don't need to be on this network. So I can have more gas to supply to Dangote, uh, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. That's gas. I'm coming, sir. Take, for example, the issue that uh, Cohen just showed us here. He says there's a shortfall of about a trillion. That is, we have produced power, sold to embed government agency, and they have sold it to the disco. Disco, out of one trillion, paid back about 300 uh, billion owing how much? 700 billion. That figure continues to rise every day. One day, Nigeria, the government will look at that debt. One day. It's going to sell all of us in the face. We're all Nigerians. Now, the question is this. What do you do? I'm owed 75 plus and all that. So that's what accounts for maybe that 700. We we'll sit down there and agree. There's a government agency at the middle that bought my power. I need my money. The government can say, and I don't, I'm just saying even for that workshop, National Assembly, let them be there. I don't care. Everybody should be there. The, the, the judiciary, let them be there. I'll come to judiciary very soon. Now, <laughs> no, I'm coming. Because it's, we're going to start talking and talking about next year we'll be here. Power will continue talking. Now, the government says, okay, there's a line we're drawing today. This 700 billion that is being owed, all the company being owed will give you bonds. 10-year bonds, 20-year bonds. That is a line drawn. But from today, there will be no more outstanding debts. Now, the discos who owe this 700 billion are saying that that money, yes, we're owing, but if you had increased the tariff properly five years ago, three years ago, two years ago, I won't be owing 700 billion. What the government needs to do is to work out how much of that 700 billion is because of tariff. And you may get that part out. You now say, this is one we actually subsidized because they didn't want Nigerians to pay 45 naira. They were forcing them to sell at 28. So this other one, government will bear it. But this other one that because the disco failed to do their job, to go and collect the money, that one, the disco must bear it. Discos don't have the money to pay today. And therefore, the government can say, I own 40%. I will now capitalize that money that you failed to pay into the capital of that company. Government holding can then become 60, 70, 80% of a disco. It doesn't matter because if you didn't pay, that's my money. These things have to be done in a way they are sorted out, a line is drawn, and one day we now start seeing the result. You come to the judiciary, for example, sir. I'm giving you an example. Somebody went to court, the man that went to court, manufacturing of Nigeria went to court, stopping a jail because someone was stopping, stopping that. The same man is using a gigantic generator. Generating power at about 100 naira per you know, kilowatt or whatever. And here, there's a possibility that you could have gotten power at about 45 or 50 or 60. And because we all know our legal system that I can go to court and stop you for five years, nobody has had a case. It's been adjourned, 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 adjourned. What are we adjourning? Adjourning the problems? That is the issue. 
So such cases, judiciary, if there's a way you can start today, hear your cases and so on, throw things out the way you want to throw it out, let it be. Eligible customers, people go to court and stop you. You can't do this because they know that in Nigeria, court cases will be there for 10 years. Can we find a solution? There's arbitration clause in all these things, really, that nobody wants to use. And I'm sure the lawyers here in Amis knows, you go through arbitration. If you're not happy, you cannot go to court. But at least as a process, that arbitration will give you a quicker result. The Jenkos are not too happy. There are things that were not being paid for. That's what we call capacity payment. But we're bearing that for now because Nobody starts to put a power plant they want. Okay, I want to put in 100 megawatts quickly, go and get it. No, those plants are manufactured over a period of two years, three years, and so on. And so if I can put in a 1,000 megawatt plant, you have to pay me on the capacity, because that's what I took about five years or more to do. But then I may be generating 600, 700, as need, need be. Do you know that there's also what we call load rejection? that I produce, so maybe I produce 400 megawatts, I send it to GCN, to the National Control Center in Oshobo, and I just get a call, can you ram down? That is reduced. And then I ram down, because the network is fluctuating between a particular you know, level. So what is the problem? Why can't TCN, for example, have, I mean, if other countries have power 24 seven, why is it in Nigeria that I produce power? And then somebody say, run me down, run down, run down, run down. Because he's also looking at the disco. Disco, at the other end, let's be truthful to all these issues. Disco, at the other end, has refused, I mean, uh, let me say, refused to take the power. Why? The disco doesn't want to take the power. It doesn't want to take 200 megawatt because it doesn't have the money to pay at the end of the day. Therefore, he curtails the whole thing and says, okay, give me only 80. And then because the NCC cannot take the whole thing, they now come back to me and say, ram down. I ram down my, my turbine that has a capacity of 115. I ram it down to about 70. If you have a car with a big capacity and you're asked to bring that, what happens? Over time, it wears out. The generator at home, 70 kVA or 40 kVA, you put it on, only put one AC. Instead of maybe two or three or five AC, what happens? You're yeah, wearing that, that engine, invariably. So the whole, the many issues in this sector, that's why I said, let's end the blame game. Let's possibly have a situation where we sit down the one. You know, if you have gone to GE for training, that's one of the rooms they call the pit. When you have a problem, such a big company like that, they ask you to go to the pit. That's where you take off your jacket, take everything out, sit down there, find a solution, come out of it with the result. Let's sit down and go through all of this. BP regulators are there, everybody will be there. If we agree on A, let's implement. If we agree on B, let's implement. If we agree on C, let's implement. Some may be short term, long term, as the case may be. Then we'll now stop this issue. We'll come to meter. If the issue has to be that meters must be available, I don't think it can take us, I mean, for example, as the NEC has approved, which is being implemented, new meter rollout through the meter access provider and all that. There must be a time frame. It's not just enough to see in the papers, people shaking hands. We are launching, we are launching that. What's the time frame for you to provide meter, one million meters to people in Lagos or in Abuja or in this place? You must abide by it and let's get it done. Then maybe after that period, we no longer have this issue of collection problems. So like I said, sorry, <laughs> going too far because I've been on this, we've talked about it with the minister, we'll shout, we'll talk, but over the last three, four years, nothing is actually, gradually they have been done, but it's not really the way we want, we want action, and that you really bring the result we are expecting to see. Thank you. Should I still, should I still be asking the panel to respond to anything? <laughs> But okay, so let me let me take a comment from you, sir. Okay. Uh, come in, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, for my president, good afternoon. Um, my name is Chie Dubu. I'm the MD of Niger Data Power Holding Company, and also had the privilege of um, having worked um, with the senior partner, Chief Dibu, uh, for a program at BP where I was embedded for years. So I just want to clarify to Jonathan. 
that yes, the concept, the retail trading, it's fine, but it was also part of our market design. Uh, part of market design. Um, the market design is such that we progress through stages of the market from the pre-transition to the transition. We're in the transitional electricity market now, or we ought to be, uh, because it's supposed to be a contract-driven market, but we have issues like you identified, then to medium term to, and then long term. The, I think somewhere around the medium term or the long term, this, uh, we achieve competition that will allow retail trading. It's there in the market design, it is there in our market rules. I'm sure it's there in the market rules, if you look at market rules. So it's good thought, it's a good, um, and we also thought about it at the time of um, developing the market under the DG of, for my DG of BPA. Um, uh, another comment on, I mean, the much um, talked about um, tariff issue. Uh, NS spoke were eloquently about the uh, 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 distribution problems and all that. Just like Chief Naram also pointed out, we've had discussions over and over on all these issues. The point remains that yes, everybody, it's agreed that there is a tariff shortfall, no doubt about that. But the level of shortfall we experience in the market now, it's, it's, it's um, uh, 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 abnormal, excessive. Um, if I, I, I Ernest painted the picture that uh, tariff will be somewhere around 50 Naira, uh, that's, that means that we have about, say, 44% shortfall. But the shortfall we get from the market somewhere around 75 and 80%. Now, the payment assurance program has ended. It ended in December. They remitted the discos, remitted in January, I think 17 point something percent to the market. In February, they, remi they remitted 22 point something percent. That's, that will pay the whole value chain up to generation companies like us. We use gas. Gas, for every month invoice we send, gas constitutes about 50% or more of that invoice. That means with 22.5%, the best they've done this year, we can't even pay for the gas because they are doing 22.5%. If their tariff were to be 15 Naira, then uh, 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 the shortfall would have been, say, about 44%. But the shortfall we have now is about 75-80%. That's a big problem for us. And that shows, this goes why they have collision inefficiencies. Quit the regulator has, is not trying to address through the meter asset provider regulation. And uh, if we can get that done, that's one way to resolving that issue. Uh, another area is the fact that even when their collection improves, we are not sure. And that's where uh, the DGBP, my brother, should hold the discos accountable. There's a lot of indiscipline on the part of discos, not earnest. I mean, when we are talking about re uh, remittances, a code disco did 70% in, 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 uh, in February. I saw it, 70%. But there are discos that did just 11%. 11% remittance. How are we going to survive in that kind of market? It's, it's terrible. So um, we need, there need to be some, uh, 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 they have to be held accountable. They have performance agreements. DG, uh, DGBP, you have to hold the discourse accountable because if we don't, this market is going to collapse and that is not what we are looking forward to. Uh, I, I think, um, uh, Chief Idigbe, you made the point, sir. Sorry, sir. No, no, no. Okay. You made the point about the energy requirement. I think I agree with you by our size, but the truth remains again that I think from the experience, either by Eco Disco or Ikeja Disco, where they try to supply an area, electricity, and um, ensure that they have reliable, let me not use un uninterrupted, uh, they found out again after one month or a few months of trial that people were now switching off from the, uh, from the, 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 the public electricity to their private because they say they uh, can't afford it. That's what, I think it was Keja Disco that said that. Now, that should, and if you look at electricity, it's a function of per capita income. It's not just the population. People, are they able to pay? If you look at some estates, some people will pack out because they say it's too expensive. Some people will want to pay. So, at the, at the average of 60 Naira per kilowatt hour, 
not many people can afford uh, with the present uh, income level in Nigeria to pay for electricity. So uh, my take on that is that let us even optimize what we have now and see where we go from there. We have somewhere around 13,000, 14,000 installed capacity. If we're able to bring that and serve Nigerians, I'm sure from there we can there take it up and see how much Nigerians can, can afford to buy. Um, the man from the regulatory commission said some villages are paying 175 naira per kilowatt hour. I sincerely, I don't know which village can afford that, honestly. Honestly, I don't know which village can afford that because I live in an estate where once it exceeded 70 naira, people were really, really, really angry. And this is middle class environment, not, not even the village. So um, if we optimize what we have now, then we are now able to know what our needs will be. Maybe suppress demand, people will now begin to connect. But electricity is not as cheap as people think it is. It costs money like Ernest has been saying, and it's a lot of money involved. So that's my, my two cents intervention. Thank you very much. Now your two cents is less than my two standard. <laughs> But I think, honestly, it's about to three. What I'd like to do out of respect to the panelists is um, allow them a minute each to sort of like wrap up in their own perspectives. And uh, we can allow the rest of this program to proceed and we can end everything just before three o'clock. Uh, please note also that there's lunch. Yeah? <laughs> That man shouting there, you didn't pay your NEPA bill. <laughs> okay, so let me start with Ernest. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will try and be as quick as possible. Somebody asked how we're still in business. Um, you know, um, the reason we're in business is the reason uh, Chiedre is complaining, that we are not able to pay the invoices that come to us. The reason is, as I explained earlier, the unit we sell, we collect 22 Naira. The amount that comes as invoice from NBET is approximately 23, 24, inclusive of transmission. So quite frankly, we just can't even pay. So the only thing that happens, and what he's talking to, and I do share his point, is how to share the poverty that exists in the sector because the money is not enough. I, he would agree to that, he said so himself. All he's saying is, please give us more. We are saying that we don't even have enough to maintain the asset. Now, bear in mind that if the asset is not maintained, you can't switch it on to take more load. So if I do not maintain my asset, if you like, generate as much as you like, I won't be able to take the load. That is the vicious cycle. It's unfortunate, but we need to solve this problem really in a holistic manner. And quite frankly, you and I should be sitting down drinking a, a, a nice drink rather than talk about how to share money that is not enough for either you or me. That is the truth. Second one is um, somebody talked about discos. We didn't know what we were buying or something like that. A quick response is this. We knew what we were buying because there were assumptions that were made. It was made clear to us that the assumptions will be checked later on. After they are confirmed, after we've taken over the assets, then adjustments will be made. That exercise did take place. The problem was when the adjustments were being made, had been agreed, they were not implemented on the tariff side. That is why we have the problem. So let it be clear, we knew what we were buying. The structure that was implemented by BPE was a transparent and it was a good structure. We have no complaints about that. The truth is they did a good job and uh, I still commend them like everyone else all over the world. Um, they talked about eligible customers. The issue we have with eligible customers as discos is simple. A hotel like a co-hotel pays approximately 38 Naira per unit of electricity. You, as a resident, a private resident, you pay 24 Naira. That is what we call 
cross subsidy. So a co hotel pays more, so you can pay less. So when a co hotel leaves, invariably because of the model for what we call a liable revenue, because we cannot under recover and we cannot over recover, your tariff will go from 24 naira to something like 28 naira or 29 naira to compensate for the people who are leaving the system under eligible customers. Now, there is a solution which was embedded in the act itself, which says there's what you call competition transition charge, CTC, to compensate the discos when people leave, which is fine. The problem is it has not been implemented. The methodology has not been implemented. So if eligible is to work, so be it. However, compensate the discos for the exit. If, it, if you don't compensate the discos, then the other tariff for the people left behind has to be raised which we don't think is palatable. I think the final one is just to mention that there was always a recognition that there was a need for subsidy in the system at the beginning. There was a hundred billion, which I believe BP will confirm, was meant to have been put in at the beginning for tariff at the beginning, but that money never came. And I think that caused a lot of problems in distorting things at the beginning in terms of uh, our ability to be able to implement things. But thank you very much uh, uh, for the opportunity. Um, yes, Alex, I know even if that uh, 100 billion was put in place by now, it would have been chopped and nothing would be left still and we'll still be back to square one. But be that as it may, um, BPE, you've heard all of this. Um, a good endorsement has been given to you. Um, at the next session, where the BPE is not in attendance, I would like to listen to Ernest Oji. <laughs> but for today, we take that to be the real situation. So, give us a wrap up. Thank you very much, Ernest. Um, sorry, Henry. Uh, I think that, to be, to be honest, um, the privatization program for the power sector was thoroughly thought through. Uh, and I think that, you know, uh, in terms of its structure, uh, well, like the minister said, with benefit of hindsight, maybe certain things may have been done differently. But, but I, I don't have a problem with the, the way that the privatization was structured. But I wanted to make a comment in terms of the PAGPAF that the DG spoke about. We are not against the PAGPAF. We just think that there must be some better way of providing this, uh, of meeting this shortfall or gap. It is inconceivable that government will continue to have the capacity to provide that kind of funding for the sector. If the PAG is renewed, second round, we're going to be talking about 1.4 trillion. Initial one was 701 billion. If you renew it and put another 700, that's 1.4 trillion. Now, the question is, does government have that money? The second thing is that even if it does, is that the best way to use that kind of money, right? Uh, so we are not against PAGPF, but we just feel that there must be a better way of uh, ensuring, you know, that the whole sector is viable, and where we notice shortfalls, then there must be some more creative avenues for bridging that um, that that sh shortfall. And we've talked about, uh, you know, uh, frameworks around bonds and other types of, uh, you know, instruments that can cover that that shortfall. The question around the performance agreement. Okay, so the discourse, the effective date for the performance agreements uh, for all the discourse with the uh, with the exception of Cardinal Disco was twenty. Sorry, was um, November first, two thousand and thirteen, which meant that ordinarily the performance agreements should have been up for review. Uh, by 31st October last year, 2018. But there was a certain assumption in the whole agreement and the whole program itself, which uh, you know, meant that because the discos could not establish the actual loss levels, the ATC and C at the time that the franchise areas were handed over, they needed to conduct you know, uh, their own studies after the handover date, right? And that took place 
in 2014. It was recognized by both BP and NEC and then used as the basis for the uh, MITO of 2015, I believe, for the implementation of that. So we took the view that with the exception of DISCO, uh, sorry, Cardinal DISCO, the effective date for the performance agreement is January 1st, 2015, which means that the performance agreements will be due for review at the end of this year, and Cardinal DISCO end of, uh, of next year. So we're, we're looking at the, the performance agreements, but that's the, that's the situation as far as the agreements are concerned. The last point I'd like to make uh, relates to the meter, and the gentleman from NEC spoke extensively about that. I just wanted to make the point that um, metering is more of a consumption uh, uh, measurement tool and not really a payment assurance tool, right? So you can make a view, I mean, you can make a point and say, well, if they are prepaid meters, they can serve both, uh, both purposes. But where bypass is huge, where, you know, and we've seen cases where even respected members of the society, including police officers, judges, are bypassing meter. So what that does is that, yes, you, you have an illusion that you have an instrument that will help in ensuring revenues are protected. However, that is just consumption is taking place while revenue is not uh, being, being collected. So those are the issues around uh, uh, metering. I think that we should be more aggressive in ensuring that the discos provide the meters. But the more uh, important issue is that they must then speak directly to revenues uh, in such a way that those, those meters are not, uh, are not compromised. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Alex. Um, let me then yield last word here to senior partner Punuka Artonis, um, Chief Tony Dibwe. Two minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really so grateful uh, for all the contribution today. Um, there is no doubt that um, we have, um, <clears throat> in very many ways, considered deeply the topic of rethinking the model. Uh, for the electricity industry in Nigeria. It seems to me that we are all in agreement that there is no going back on the idea of privatization. It seems to me, it seems to me that the issue is just for us to see how we can fine tune what we have. And that's the way forward in the world. The government cannot do everything for us. We need to ensure that the private sector plays a more dominant role in provision of electricity. But the government still has a role to play the role of being a regulator. We need to have a more proactive um, approach to regulation. And by being more proactive, it needs to be more collaborative uh, and not silo-based, where the uh, regulator sits like um, armchair in an armchair and expects the operator to to sit separately and then issues orders. I, I think that um, the purpose of this discussion was to encourage that sort of collaboration and that's why we brought industry, uh, regula regulators, policy makers, um, uh, operators, uh, and other participants uh, together. I just want to say that all of us have a role, even as private citizens. Um, most of these um, processes uh, are designed with certain assumptions. You know that many formulas, uh, there's no, uh, any formula you have is based on some assumptions. And therefore, any design of any model is also based on some assumptions. For instance, you have to make an assumption as to honesty or level of honesty. 
And so if you don't have that uh, uh, level of honesty or level of trust, the entire system will collapse. Imagine that everything we have been talking about goes back finally to one consumer who either pays or does not pay for electricity and how much that consumer pays. And, and that's because that is where the money is going to come from to the entire system and all the investments that are made upstream in the, in the chain. And if that person does not pay for whatever reason, uh, then the entire system will collapse. So we also need to change our behavior. So everybody in the system needs to change. The government, us as private individuals, the operators, uh, the regulators, uh, etc. But I would just like to end by saying lawyers play a critical role in this entire process. Uh, and I think they can even play a larger role. Uh, for instance, uh, lawyers bring certainty to the process. Uh, contracts are supposed to bring certainty, uh, and uh, it is important that those rights are tested in court. And uh, indeed, many of the solutions that have been suggested, for instance, uh, um, uh, Jonathan suggested uh, perhaps uh, a takeover of um, uh, some of the non-performing uh, discos, for instance. That can be done in the ordinary course of uh, enforcement of legal rights. You know, you can put them into insolvency, for instance, and then uh, as the uh, main creditor, you, you take over the company, and then you can have a debt equity swap where the debts, and I think somebody mentioned it, uh, et cetera. So there, there are lots of markets that we can develop uh, that, that will then bring in liquidity because you can, uh, you, you can engineer through legal processes, change in, uh, in, in uh, government and management of uh, many of these uh, assets. <clears throat> and until these things are tested, people are going to basically um, uh, sort of like sit on um, our, our future and do nothing. And we'll continue to complain. So it, we can't all wait for government alone to change things by exercising our legal rights within the framework of the law, we also can change behavior of those uh, who are actually controlling our destiny. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being such um, a wonderful. Ah, you didn't wait for me to dismiss you. <laughs> okay, then, so we can we, we can get on with it. Please give the panelists um, a round of applause. I am sure this is a conversation that would uh, continue for the foreseeable future, but indeed we've all been enriched by knowledge and by our ability to contribute. What I'd like to ask, please, is um, everybody, can you just give us about five, ten minutes max? We would bring this to a very fitting close. Um, I think um, Punu Khartan is... Um, seeks to make certain presentations, and I'd like to invite a partner, uh, Madam Ebele Neda, to uh, step forward and uh, do the honors right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another round of applause for our discussant. You would agree with me that it has really been a wonderful day spent discussing power. At least when we go away from here, when people are criticizing Nepal, we can critique them you know, with, um, with the right uh, knowledge, really. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And as part of our position to our discussant, we'll be making some presentations so that tomorrow when you look at that, uh, when you look at what we are giving you, you know how appreciative we are, we are of your time that you have spent here today. And to do us the honor of making the presentation, we want to invite the Father of the Day, His Excellency, General Dr. Yakubu Gowon, to come and make the presentation. Please, a round of applause as he comes forward. Thank you. So the first presentation will go to our very wonderful chairman. So we are so appreciative. Please, can you come forward? Thank you so much, sir. We are grateful for the role you played here today, sir. Thank you. And the second presentation will go to our, our guest speaker, Mr. J Jonathan Cohen, for coming all the way to give us that the wonderful information. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing to come. 
Thank you. Thank you. We'll also be inviting the former CGN, Justice Belgura, for the second set of presentation to be made. So we're making the presentation to the discussant, and for the first, we are going to invite the DG of BP, Mr. Alex Okofo. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. From the board and management of Punuka, we're very, very grateful. And the second presentation will go to Mr. Alex, Mr. NS Oji. Mr. NS Oji. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. These are captains of the industry. They are very busy people. Thank you so much for coming. Puruka, appreciate your time, sir. Thank you so much. The last presentation, but not the least, definitely. The last, but not the least, goes to a very wonderful compare, our MC. We are very grateful. I know he wasn't expecting it, Dr. Henry Zeku, but we cannot but give you this. Okay. Okay, you have two of them giving it to you at the same time. <laughs> So that is a double honor for you. The Senior Associate Punuka Attorneys, Mr. Eric Otojahi, to deliver the formal appreciation. Eric. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Nzaku. Um, the Chairman, Mr. Emmanuel Norum, CEO of Health Holdings Limited, His Excellency, General Dr. Yakubu Gowon, GCFR. Your Excellencies here present, Honorable Minister of Power, Works and Housing, His Excellency Babatunde Raji Fashola, my Lords here present, our guest speaker, Mr. Jonathan Cohen, Senior Associates, Senior Advocates of Nigeria here present, our eminent discussants, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, all other protocols duly observed. On behalf of the Board of Partners, the management and staff of Punuka Attorneys and Solicitors, we sincerely thank all our guests for honoring our invitation and participating in this year's Punuka Annual Lecture. Our profound gratitude goes to the Father of the Day, His Excellency General Dr. Yakubu Gowan, GCFR, for gracing this event. Sir, we are most grateful. We sincerely thank our chairman, Mr. Emmanuel Norum, for accepting to chair this event. We are most grateful. We also sincerely appreciate the Honorable Minister of Power, Works and Housing, Babatunde Raji Fashola, SAN, for honoring our invitation and accepting to deliver the keynote address. We are grateful. Our sincere appreciation also goes to the guest speaker, Mr. Jonathan Cohen, who flew all the way from Manchester, the United Kingdom, to give this lecture. We thank our dis distinguished discussants for making our time to participate in the discussion. To our moderator, Dr. Henry Nzeku, we say a big thank you to you, sir, for accepting to moderate the event, and we say you've done justice to it. We are most grateful. Permit me to acknowledge with thanks JPCS Immigration Consultants Incorporate, Tom Oxford Limited, and Donna Wayne for their support through sponsored adverts in our program. We are most grateful. 
I wish to give a big shout out to the members of this year's planning committee, Tobin Annamani, Afame Funamagu, Akimumi Ajiboye, and others who worked tirelessly to ensure the success, successful outcome of this lecture. We thank the board of partners, the management and staff of Punuka attorneys and solicitors for their support. We also thank everyone that has made this lecture a success. We wish everyone journey masses to your various destinations as we come to a close of this event. Thank you and God bless you all. Long live Punuka, long live the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you.